Welcome to the Kings Beat Podcast. I am James Ham, your Kings Insider for ESPN 1320 and the Kings Beat. Joining me today, Fox 40, Sean Cunningham. Sean, how are you? You're back. I'm back. I am back. And with a vengeance, right? Uh, I actually think it's going to be kind of funny that uh, it's possible you could listen to this podcast for the first time either later tonight or possibly tomorrow. We're recording this on a Tuesday afternoon. And the Kings could be in second place, man, in the Western Conference. How about that? How about that? Okay, and of course, joining us as well is a Brendan Nunes from the Kings Pulse podcast. Brendan, how are you? I'm doing good. Doing good. Nothing special going on. Another day in the life, I guess. Can't complain. How are you, you doing, James? Yet? I'm good. We got a day no off. Comment. Uh-oh. No car? No car. No. It's actually going into the <laughs> shop tomorrow, finally, believe it or not. And then it's going to be like two weeks. Oh, well, I do we'll see, not, but we'll see. We'll see. <laughs> uh, in case you have no idea what we're talking about, Brendan is at his car in the shop. Well, Brendan got hit like a few months ago. and We're finally processing uh, the vehicle. And so hopefully Brendan will be uh, fully functioning. And it's a nice car. It's not like he doesn't drive some like crazy, like 19... 19- 78 Dotson uh, B210 or something. Wow, yeah. Dotson reference. I, I think it'd be fun if people probably hear like, oh, Brendan got his driver's license. Like, no, he's not that young, guys. <laughs> <laughs> it's not. Uh, my it's youngest, my, uh, my yeah. youngest is just about to get his permit, which is crazy. Oh, um, look out. Yeah, he was at the game last night. I, both my boys were at the game with the wife. Uh, she took a, a load, a car load of. Uh, soccer kids to uh, to the game so um, they had a good time it was a good random uh, note good... i knew a f- friend of mine when he got his permit uh he would drive his uh father to and from the or pick him how'd it work he picked him up from the bar <laughs> because he had his permit and he was able to do it and i think this is in nevada of course small town in nevada when i was playing baseball out there but mm-hmm. yeah pretty pretty funny stuff probably not wild the most safe but yeah yeah, it's crazy now. They put all these restrictions on the kids, which which is a good thing. So they can't drive with anyone else under the age of 18 in the car for the first year. And uh, so he'll get his driver's license, and then we'll make him drive a tank. We have a, a huge four-wheel drive Suburban. And, like, my boys are taught that if someone makes a mistake, don't hit the brakes, just hit the gas. Um, like, in, wow. inflict the pain, you know, because that way you're not the one getting damaged. Uh, and they're not allowed to drive on highway 49, which is like the main road out here, which is bad. Lots of, lots of head on collisions and deaths on highway 49 each and every year. So, yeah. So avoid Um, highway 49. Yeah, definitely. Okay. So, uh, we are not live today, which is different. Uh, we've actually done a lot of live shows lately, uh, which I like Sean likes, I think Brendan likes, um, but, uh, and I think everyone else does too. It's like interactive and all that stuff. Uh, sometimes it just doesn't work out though. We have uh, busy lives that we have to schedule these podcasts around. So uh, first and foremost, um, if you are watching on YouTube and you don't mind, give us a thumbs up. Uh, you could also subscribe to the YouTube channel. We're growing. We're over 2,500 followers on YouTube, which is awesome. Um, and uh, if you really like our contact, uh, our content, uh, jump on board with the King's Beat. Uh, go to thekingsbeat.com and become a subscriber. If you love us, become premium subscribers to help support the cause here at the King's Beat. Uh, we will have happy hour coming up. Uh, we do have a scheduling issue with a bunch of Thursday games coming up. Uh, so I'm going to have to figure that one out. It's probably going to be, I'm hoping, next week. Uh, but I'll have to choose another day other than Thursday. So maybe Wednesday, maybe we do a weekend one. I don't know. Uh, I'll talk it over the guys here, and we'll figure it out. Um, so let's get to the show. As Sean mentioned in the opening, um, the Kings are a half game back of the Memphis Grizzlies uh, for the number two seed in the Western Conference. The Kings have, I believe, 18 games left on the schedule, and they're one of the few teams with 18 games. Most of the teams have fewer than 18 games remaining. Uh, so this is uh, this is crunch time. It's pretty crazy. Um Brennan, since Sean brought it up, I'll, I'll go to you first. Just what are your thoughts on the 38 and – is that what it is? 38 and 26 Six. Sacramento Kings. Yeah, I mean, what a time to be alive. I guess I <laughs> hopped on the beat at a good time. Jeez. <laughs> you know? 
Um, what a time to be alive. <laughs> just, just hearing you say that's pretty crazy. Uh, half a game behind the two seed in the Western Conference is quite a spot to be in. And the Kings have been sitting at that three seed for a little while now. Um, they're playing great basketball and it's a lot of the same, you know, they're a phenomenal offensive team. And as long as they can play defense for 20 minutes or so, they seem to at least do okay and put themselves in a position where they're going to be competitive late in games. And we saw that in that game against the Pelicans. I thought that that was a really big one specifically without the Aaron Fox. What stood out to me is, you know, those minutes where Demonis Sabonis is on the bench. Typically they're trying to keep one of Sabonis or Fox on the floor. So when Sabonis is not, uh, on the floor, and De'Aaron is unavailable with that lingering hamstring uh, soreness that he has going on. I was kind of concerned there, but I thought the bench did a great job. I thought that Chemezi Metu and Trey Lyles had great performance, and Davion Mitchell stepping up in place of De'Aaron Fox played amazingly. So getting wins like that when you're missing one of your stars and every game is so important down the stretch is, is essential for this team, and it was a great showing last night. Sean? Oh yes, sorry. I, uh, <laughs> he hit it all. I mean, yeah. To to be, it's so funny because um, I was talking to a few people before the game uh, last night, before the win over uh, the Pelicans, and it it just really stands to like every. I think people are guilty of really overanalyzing every single game, and I think we can group ourselves into that as well. Um, you know, even when they look. We've talked about how fun this team is from an offensive standpoint, how frustrating they can be from a defensive standpoint. And I think they're probably at their most concerning one, uh, maybe, maybe not the most, but among their most concerning moments of the season on the defensive end, because they're back down to 28th and you've seen a little bit of growth at times. And now it's just, there's some, there's, there's questions whether or not they can do that in the postseason. It's just, you know, trying to remind people just the fact that they are in the postseason, the fact that they are third and here they're about to get second. Like this is a formula that has worked and you can argue whether it'll work in a postseason uh, series, especially in a seven game series. But this is, I like to call it house money. I like to call it because I didn't, you know, none of us expected this. Uh, I certainly didn't. And James, you and I end up being some of the most pessimistic people when it comes to Kings coverage, just because we haven't seen it. But um, and, and I might even be, I'm, I think I'm even probably more pessimistic than anybody. So, uh, yeah, this is, this is a surprise. It's fun. Um, it, it's, it's fun to watch them grow. It's fun to have them as Brendan mentioned, guys like Trey Lyles, Chemezi Metu, uh, people who can step up in the right moments. It seems to be somebody every night, uh, offensively and defensively, the littlest adjustments can make the biggest difference. And you look at last night and I thought they came out with a defensive focus right out of the gate. I mean, you saw deflections and then all of a sudden it kind of went away. Second half, they go to that zone. Um, I, I don't know that that's sustainable, but it certainly looked like it caught uh, New Orleans by surprise. And um, it just guys answering the call and they're doing it in the right moments when a, you know, a talent like their all-star Deer and Fox is, is out. And, 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 you know, not that that's anything to be totally concerned about, but I, I like the approach with that give him this game off give him a good four days off before he takes on a very uh, talented Knicks team that's peaking at the right time for them as well so uh, I know that's just a rambling way and I'm shooting to a lot of fields and a lot of topics there but um, I'm just kind of reminding people enjoy the ride man because this is it's a lot of fun yeah Sean just took a scatter gun to all of our uh, yep. all of our topics he just loaded up the buckshot and uh, no I, I'm just I, I'm just Kidding with Sean. Um, yeah, like a couple of things I want to point out. Like, I don't remember what date it was that the Kings moved into the third seed, but it's January eleventh, I, I think. I don't think that they've ever moved out of it. They've right. they've been in the third. They got to the third, and then they haven't like relinquished the third, which is kind of strange. Um, and, and now we're at a point where. You know, if you're looking at the loss column, they're three games up on the Suns in the loss column, um, two and a half games up overall. Uh, but the Warriors, the Kings are five games up on the Warriors in the loss column with 18 remaining, um, which that's that's crazy. And the Warriors are actually, I think they only have 17 games remaining. Um, so to put that in perspective, five games in the loss column, and they've got 17 games, that means that they've got to go, if the, the Kings went... Uh, 13 and five, the Warriors would have to win out, right? 
So we tried to go through some of this before, but, um, and then I'll also point out, there's a couple other things that are really interesting. The Kings have the best road, road record in the Western Conference at 18 and 13. Um, their home record is up to 20 and 13, which is good. Uh, it's not great. Uh, especially when you look at Denver, who's like 30 and four and Memphis, who's 26 and five at home. Uh, so the Kings are beatable at home. Uh, but it, uh, to me, it's, it's interesting that we're watching a team that is starting to f- figure out new and exciting ways to win, but also here they are five and six since the all-star break when things are supposed to be so much more dramatically difficult and they're still finding ways to win. And for the most part, I think it's that they outscore everybody. Their offensive rating is, I think it's 118.6, which is the highest ever in the history of the NBA, which is crazy. Their defensive rating actually went down after the last game. And I think, Sean, you mentioned, I think, that they're 28. I think they're uh, they're 26 after last night's game. Either way, it's not great. Oh, they're 25th, and they're really not that far away from, like, being 23rd. Uh, but for them to, like, get into the top 15 or something at this point, it's nearly impossible. Uh, and Brennan's shaking his head like, that ain't happening. Homie, don't play they're that. They're shit at defense. Let's be real. <laughs> yeah, they're terrible. Let's be real. And... and, and I'm and to be honest, they're 28th in just points per game and points wow. per game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's that's I that <laughs> I should have looked at the rating. You're right, but uh, yeah, no, they're they're garbage. And, and and you know, kind of brings up a um a discussion I was having over lunch. I was having a discussion about coach of the year, and I know like Mike Brown. And for many Kings fans, it might think like a no like might be a no brainer, and it, it it might be certainly, but just looking at it completely unbiased. In NBA coach of the year ends up sometimes going to the team whose coach they didn't expect them to be in the conversation. So Mike Brown certainly checks that box and fits that mold. And if he gets it, no qualms here, but I'm not voting for him. I, if I don't have a vote, but it wouldn't be me. I mean, I'm looking around like the West is so crazy. You could make an argument for Mike Brown. Certainly. I'm not saying he's not worthy of the attention, but like Mike Budenholzer, um, what, what Joe Mazzula is doing in Boston after takeover for Ume, Ime Odoka. You could even make an argument for Michael Malone, the one team who's held down the West and number one in the West. And then you can even make an argument for, if you want to think of another coach that like doesn't have his team in the conversation ahead of the season, maybe not the expectations that they are now. I just mentioned the Knicks. Tom Thibodeau could be in that discussion. The Knicks have one more win than the Kings do. So like if you put the Knicks in the Western Conference, like there's, there's arguments to be made is what I'm saying. And certainly, you know, people are going to remember the 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 feel good story that is Mike Brown and the 16 wins but like the bucks are the dominant team in the league the celtics are the dominant team in the league you can make arguments for all of them um but it's it, it's just we're already having those conversations and i know today especially when people are looking at the mvp race and you know race gets brought into it with nikola jokic versus somebody like giannis antetokounmpo or even you know joel embiid things like that um it's those discussions are already being already have uh kind of on their way and um with the way the kings are doing though it doesn't whether they get that award or not it it doesn't matter i mean the the kings what they're doing right now is fantastic but you're getting the attention of mike brown and it's like no you still have a team that's terrible defensively and despite that they might reach two in the western conference what the hell yeah but they also they haven't (laughs) been in the they haven't been the playoffs in 16 years right Uh, so i and i don't care like again like missoula has done a great job but he's done a great job with the team that was in the finals last year the bucks like budenholzer has done a great job he's he's doing a great job with the team that won the the nba championship like two or three years ago well Um, objectively but think of but but not to cut i mean ime odoka i mean they stumbled remember the, the 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 celtics stumbled and they needed a uh, a big win streak to turn their season around last year. Missoula didn't need that at all. They're right. They're knocking on the door, and they've been consistent all year long. Um, I'm just saying objectively. Yeah, like, but he take had off a the s- purple colored glasses and you know yeah, Kool Aid, but- and like you can you can make arguments for all these for all these folks is what I'm saying. No, I, I get what you're saying, but I'll also say like like Joe Missoula, like he didn't crash a Ferrari. Right. I mean that's that's basically like the, you don't get props for not crashing a Ferrari in the parking lot. Uh, you know, so for me, like, I, I don't know, I, I wouldn't even consider him. Now, Michael Malone, on the other hand, I would consider just because he is, he's led the team that's like been number one in the West all season long. Um, and against, you know, not, not against all odds because he does have the two-time reigning MVP and potentially three-time reigning MVP who has even gotten better. Uh, if you right. look at all of his stats over the last couple of years, 
Brennan, you just want to like slap Sean. I just can't believe Sean. I think he wants people to be mad at him all the time. No, I don't, I don't understand. <laughs> no, I, I do get what you're saying that there's arguments for everybody, but like I think there's a reason that Mike Brown is the favorite. You know, I, Missoula was the other standout to me that I actually thought probably would have been the favorite, but I think recently um, the Celtics are are slumping a little bit right now, and there's a lot of conversations about um, the adjustments that Missoula is or is not making. And the Kings have had their slumps as well. But like these other teams we're talking about, I mean, like have MVP candidates on their roster, you know, like they shouldn't I, be I punished think, for that, though. No, they They're shouldn't be. But I think that Mike Brown should get um, additional acknowledgement for not having as talented of a roster as some of these other guys. And especially considering the starting point expectations coming into the year, like to me, it makes a lot of sense why Mike Brown is the odds on favorite in most places I've looked. But I, I absolutely get what you're saying, that there's other arguments. I just think you're ballsy for coming on a King's podcast. And <laughs> ballsy. Saying that. Well, I'll say, like, <laughs> again, well, a King, a King's podcast be damned. Like, it's it's objective journalism is what it is. I so agree. I'm not going to sit here and just root on the Kings and say they deserve everything uh, when there's legitimate arguments to be made to the contrary, as much as fans might bristle at that. This is not a fan podcast. So um, I will say this, too, like, you didn't even mention Budenholzer, and it's like he's had legit injuries for Chris Middleton, who's an all-star in this league for majority of the season, Drew Holiday at different parts. I just think, too, it's a regular season award, and so oftentimes if you go and look through the history of Coach of the Year, uh, and I think there is an argument to be made when it comes to other uh, awards within the, the regular season, and it is a media-driven award. Like There's storylines at the media um, and narratives that, that, that go into all these things. And more times than not, and this is where I think it bodes well for Mike Brown and Kings fans wanting to see him rewarded as coach of the year, is oftentimes the, the team or the coach who does the miraculous and does things that w wasn't supposed to be expected gets rewarded for that. Um, like I think we were looking at it, Greg Popovich only won coach of the year like three times, I think it is. I don't and even know if it's that many times. crazy to think about. Like, um, But... Regardless, like that, that bodes well for people who think Mike Brown should be. And I'm, again, I'm not. If he wins it, I'm not going to, you know, go on a mountain and say no, he sucks. Get him out of there. No, he'd be absolutely worthy of the recognition. But of course, the 16 years prior to this season isn't factored in. You know what I mean? Like that isn't. There is a storyline that that's not factored into the season at, uh, as a whole. So, just well, saying I don't that, know. Okay, so like I get what you're saying there, but I'm going to tell you that that is part of the conversation when when media members are making a judgment right. call and it's not they understand it that this is a franchise that hasn't done it and they they went from bad last year out of the out of the play-in yeah. which isn't even the they couldn't even get to the 10 seed last year to you know whether it's a three seed or the two seed or the four seed whatever they're going to finish at um you know I, I still think that their people are going to look at last year's record and the last 16 years record and they look at improvement over last year um you know, and, you know, breaking the breaking the curse. I think that's going to be a big thing. Vegas right now has uh, elevated Mike Brown to like a tremendous favorite to win the award. No doubt. Yeah, no doubt. And th and that's because of the history of the of the award as well. I mean, again, the team that's not supposed to be there. You're right. There are media members look at that. It's not the way the award is a, a, is written. It's supposed to be for the year prior uh, the year as it's constructed, not not previous seasons. Again, this is his first time here. He didn't coach previous seasons you know, those all shouldn't factor in there, but I will say it will, it will bode well for him uh, because there, but the, again, you have, you have media that looks at the defensive rating and you're like, okay, you're among the worst teams in the league. How are you doing this? And that'll count against him. Yeah. But I'd say if that counts against him, you'd have to say, how in the world did you just put up the highest offensive rating ever. of all time? Right. Ever. When you're known yeah. to be a defensive coach. Yep, I exactly. looked today, and over their last 12 games, the Kings are averaging like 130.4 points per game. They're giving up like 126, but 130 a game. Like, this is wild what we're seeing. And, like, I was uh, I was talking to my, my good friend, John Santiago, who was with me at Cowbell for years uh, last night on the way home from the game. And, you know, I do my six quick thoughts after every game. You know how easy it is to write six quick thoughts on this team? Because there's always at least five guys who have scored in double figures. So it's easy to single out. If they lose, there's some things that are always easy to point out, like how bad their defense was. 
or you know if they give up like six consecutive offensive rebounds it's easy to point to the very specific reason why they lost but there's so many statistical categories that you can look at and this team is just stuffing the stat sheet like last night we get to a game where you know it's a big game but no De'Aaron Fox to have Kevin Herter like blow up for 25 points that's not that big of a deal Kevin Herter can do that but eight assists and five rebounds like that's crazy for a guy like Kevin Herter who's not a great rebounder who has had some assists and you know hasn't been a bad distributor but stepping up in that moment like I, I, we've talked about this almost every show, how, how much do we just take for granted that Sabonis walks into every single night and basically has a triple double, whether he gets it or not, whether he's one rebound or one assist away or two assists away, he's literally a walking triple double every single night. And I mean, I agree with my, I don't know about Fox being an all NBA player, uh, first, second, third team, like Mike Brown has been preaching over the last, uh, like yeah. week, that's his newest thing. Um, yeah. but I certainly think Sabonis is an all NBA player. I, I think he'll probably be a third team, all NBA player. I don't think he'll get first or second, but I, I'm pretty sure he'll be a, like right there. I, I mean, is that if we did a Tuesday over reaction Tuesday over reactions, which Sean loves like it, how far off is Mike Brown? on on his uh his idea that he has two all nba players and his reasoning being that like look we're the number two or three seed in the western conference like we should be you know on that board so bonus will be there in my mind i i think that it goes Jokic and bead sabonis and i don't think there's anybody else particularly that close you know like there's if Anthony Davis has a great close to the season or like Bam out of bio, like, and those are just to mention other names. I don't think that they're actually that close to Sabonis. It's just that for guards, I mean, you saw how difficult it was for De'Aaron to even make the all-star team. There's a lot more competition there. And it's not to take anything away from how great De'Aaron has been this season. We've seen him be phenomenal specifically in those clutch moments. Um, but all NBA for him does feel like it would be, pretty tough with how many phenomenal guards are in the entire league. Like I, I know the Kings are sitting at three and and that's the argument that Mike Brown proposes a lot. And obviously, like I said, De'Aaron has a lot of individual accomplishments to go with that as well. But that doesn't mean that, you know, it's only the teams in the top three seeds are getting players on all NBA or anything like that. They're phenomenal guards throughout the entire league. And I think it's tough for De'Aaron, but I absolutely expect Domas to be there. I don't mind 100%. Mike Brown promoting it though. No, I applaud him. In fact, that's what you have to do because it's uh, it's the right move as the head coach of a team that's about to take second place. I mean, look, media votes for your all NBA team. So um, this isn't fans and it, he's doing the right thing. He's campaigning for his guys. That being said, you're right, Brennan. Demona Sabonis is the one with a bullet that will make the all NBA and it's actually De'Aaron Fox who said it earlier this season when, may, when I think most people looked at it maybe a little bit funny at the time he said it because he said it in like November or like maybe December when he, when he first brought attention to it. And I mean, when you're, he's leading the league in rebounding, he's got the leading the league in double doubles. You're right. It's, it's Jokic, it's Embiid and it's him. So um, yeah, there's no doubt in my mind guards. It's too, it's too, it's too crowded there, but to have him in the conversation, get some consideration and probably sway some media to actually vote for him. It's the right thing to do, and it'll it, whether he gets there or not, uh, he's playing like an All NBA type talent. So I think that's that's the most important thing for this team. Okay, so like we had this conversation when Fox was trying to be an All Star, right? When he got turned down the first time, and Sean, your point was very clear. Like Fox isn't in the top twenty in scoring, and he wasn't in the top twenty in assists at that point. Um, that that's changed. It, yep. it has. I mean, at this point. Fox is assist wise, he's number 17. Um, but uh, when it comes to points per game, he's actually up to number 13 in the league. Um, he's ahead of Julius Randle, Laurie Marketin, uh, right behind guys like Jalen Brown, Trey Young. Uh, but if I look at the list, and this is purely scoring, so there, there will be other mechanisms that, that are looked at. But clearly, Luca is he leads the league in scoring and he's still considered a guard. So We'll, we'll give him all-NBA first team without any question. Damian Lillard's averaging 
points per game, third in the league, but his team is bad. Shea Gilgis Alexander is fifth in the league in scoring at 31.1, but again, his team isn't good. Uh, and then we get to Donovan Mitchell, at number eight. Um, I think Donovan Mitchell will be second, third team All NBA, most likely. Uh, John Morant at number nine, who I don't think will be All NBA. Kyrie Irving at number 10. Will he be? Will he not be? Jalen Brown at number 11. Trey Young at number 12 is a hard no. And then you get to Fox at number 13. I think that like we could squint and actually see a pathway where he could be third team all NBA. And of course, Steph isn't on that list because he hasn't played enough games. And there's probably one or two other players that could be like in the running that haven't, uh, that, that don't have enough games to register for a scoring lead. Uh, but I do think that there's like a really far fetched idea that there's a possibility of it. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, and you know, the, the, the best thing to ever happen to Aaron Fox this season was him not being named to the reserves. Uh, injury reserve is how he got in. And I think ever since he uh, made the got cut from that list, that sparked something because that's where, you know, he's been good all season. I don't want to take away from his season, but like every season we've seen that moment where, Oh, now here's Darren on this tear. And he's got this long tear now. I mean, you, you're talking about, you know, the streak of eight straight 30-point games that just got snapped the, the other night. Um, everything that had – literally, he's been on this 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 streak, in my opinion, since the moment he found out he wasn't an all-star reserve and said, all right, fuck you. I'm going to show you I'm deserving of that. And, and it's going to correlate in team success as well. He's been so hyper-focused on team, snapping the playoff drought, every, his own team success – and that was the moment in my eyes where he went, here we go. I'm going to step it up a notch. Yeah, if we're looking at the post-All-Star game schedule, De'Aaron Fox is one of the top three guards in the league in the post-All-Star right. game schedule. But, that, but even I mean, even before that, James. Even before yeah, yeah, that. Yeah, like yeah, going maybe, into the maybe break, 10 yeah. games. 10 games in before the break. Yeah. Go ahead, Brennan. I think it's interesting to me because I have seen the same as Sean for sure with that, that it seems like he's kind of turned it on since that announcement or, or lack thereof, I guess. Um, but De'Aaron's argument is that I always get better this time of year. And I think there's some validity to that. You know, if you go back to 2020, 21 post all-star break, he averaged 28.5 on 49% from the field. You go back to last year, he averaged 29.3 on 50% from the field. Like, I agree with Sean and I tend to think the same, but I, I think there is something to De'Aaron saying like, this is just the time of year he gets better. That is what we've seen. And now there's a little bit more to these games. They matter more and they're headed into a postseason. There's a little more eyes on them, but he really does get better um, come around this time of year, right before all-star break and then following it. Yeah. And I even say like, I watched like you guys did all season long, like he was a star player from the beginning of the season. He had one little lull a couple of games, but he was a star. And you're watching it the whole time like, hmm, this is crazy. Right at the moment where you, where you guys are talking about, he went from star to whether it was like sustainable or not, he became a superstar at that point and was single-handedly winning game after game, uh, you know, like taking off in the fourth quarter and dominating game after game. I mean, the 30-point streak is one thing. And it ends with him scoring 25. It's not like it ended with him scoring like six points. Um, and so for me, like there is still a possibility of what Mike Brown's talking about. I don't know if I fully buy it, but um, what I do think Fox has done is he's changed the narrative on his all-star game, like him being added to the all-star game. I don't think at this point anyone should view him at any longer as just an injury replacement. Like right. if we were to look at, if the all-star game were next week, De'Aaron Fox was in the all-star game without any question. He's been that good over the last like 20 something games. Uh, so I, I don't know. It's either way. It's a fun conversation. I, we don't even need to discuss Sabonis. Just like, no. yeah, man, you're, you're damn you're good. Really good. <laughs> you're damn good. <laughs> yeah, like watching him on and and again it's not fair for Fox because you know statistically speaking Fox has been as good or better than De, uh than Demonis but like the center position is just it's a different beast and what, what what's crazy what too and crazy? I I know I alluded to it earlier about like there's this big conversation today about 
uh, MVP and, and Jokic versus someone like Giannis and the, the thought processes that go in there and, you know, padding stats for triple doubles. And you look at Sabonis, it's like, if anyone's accusing that guy of padding stats, like you're not watching because <laughs> this dude could be so much more impactful in every single area uh, offensively that, you know, than he actually comes away with. Uh, he, he's got, he leaves buckets on the floor. He leaves assists on the floor. He leaves rebounds on the floor. Uh, there's guys that, you know, he, the T sometimes he's not as aggressive on rebounding as he probably could and even should be uh, because, you know, the team ends up crashing the board better than they did originally in the season. Um, he's just such an unselfish teammate that uh, he could easily knock all those numbers higher if he wanted to. Here's a crazy stat. Um, Sabonis is number two in the NBA in win shares as of right now behind Jokic. Yeah. And I, I'd even say this, if we look at win shares, uh, like over the, because it's, it's a stat that we kind of look at when it comes to, um, you know, how good, uh, what, what kind of impact, right? So, uh, wow, man, Jokic has been good. Win shares 15.6, 15.2 and 12.7 over the last three years. Um, and like this year he's, he's going to have more win shares, but at this point in the season, I would almost assume that like Sabonis would be close to where Jokic was in a couple of these other seasons. Uh, Jokic is averaging his win shares per 48. is just crazy. So man, that guy's good. And, and I know people are going to say, oh, we've had stats. I, I don't buy it. Uh, like do, are there times where, you know, he might get an extra rebound on missed shots and stuff? I, yeah, sure. But, um, yeah, Sabonis is crazy. I, I can't do the whole padding stats conversation. Like, Giannis <laughs> was at nine rebounds. Who cares if he got himself one more? He didn't pad all nine of those. Like, I thought it was hilarious. <laughs> I wish he would have got it. Um, I don't – there's there's times that guys are near milestones and they chase it as they should, but I don't think that's the same thing as padding stats. Um, I have no I don't, problem with it either. And, and Demonis yeah. Sponis especially is not that guy. There's times where I wish he would chase milestones a little bit more. Um, but the last thing I'll say on, on De'Aaron real quick, because I do think Domas will get that third team all NBA. I hope that De'Aaron's post uh, postseason recognition is with that Jerry West clutch player of the year award. You know, I, I think that all NBA is, is a conversation and it's not totally impossible. Um, I, I'm not expecting it, but he's averaging the most points in the clutch and doing it on 55% from the field. Like he's obviously been phenomenal in that aspect. And I hope that's how he can get his, his recognition when it comes to awards. Yeah. It's crazy. His field goal percentage, everything across the board. I mean, like just how good he's been this year is crazy. I mean, it, the three point shot isn't great, but like Fox is shooting 51.5% from the field. His mid range stuff is so, is so incredible. It, like it's automatic almost. I mean, it's, Every yeah. time free throw line extended, it's like every time he puts it up, I feel like it's going in. Yeah, I mean, if I were to, I mean, we can look at shooting splits and everything else, but the the stats are just wild. Like at the rim, he's shooting 80% on the season. From 3 to 10 feet, he's 57.7%. And from 10 to 16, he's 48.4. 16 to three-point range, he's 44.4. 48.4, 44.4. Like he's just so incredibly efficient and that that's wild. Um, okay. So uh, I don't know outside of uh, that debate, like whether these guys are, are in or not, what other takeaways did you have from, from the win over the Pelicans? Because we talked a little bit about the zone defense. Um, I think it's funny. Mike Brown said it like maybe two weeks ago that everyone has a zone defense and they all suck. Uh, yep. We talked to Kevin Herter right. about it. Yeah. Yeah. We talked to Kevin Herter about it in the locker room. Kevin Herter's like, yeah, we don't practice a zone at all. Like, and he's like, I was on, you know, the Atlanta Hawks last year. We never once practiced a zone. It's why it works for short bursts because like no one practices against it either. So they don't work on it at all. So he's like to break something up. That's fine. But realistically, is it something you can rely on? probably not and i think it's something that the kings are going to throw out there here and here and there i thought they were good defensively in the first half they just like the pelicans made good shots like i and thought that, their rotations were good their intensity was good 
that third quarter buried them. I mean, the, they were done. Yeah. And, and that team, I mean, I think that's what stood out to me too, is the Pelicans just, are they ever going to get right? Uh, is Zion ever coming back? I mean, do you want to be a buyer in them ever? Uh, it's just, it's, it's, it's always pissing in the wind with them. It's, it's just very. <laughs> I totally <laughs> agree. It is totally. I don't even know if Brennan knows what that, that means, but it it fully is. Go try it one day. Go try it. it. Just, it's just it's just that. <laughs> That's such a good way to describe their entire try. franchise. <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, yeah, we had the like Davion had good mo- moments. Uh, I thought once again Trey Lyles has like tremendous moments. Chemezi Metu, who I don't often call out for his positive things, I thought Chemezi had some really big moments. I mean. You didn't have your starting point guard and you finished with 39 assists. Like that was crazy to me. Like what they were able to do, everybody sharing the ball, everyone looking to get their teammates involved. Malik Monk was like, first of all, he didn't hardly play at all, play like two minutes in the first half, which was weird. You know why? Defensively. No, in, well, that, but in the first half, he had those back to back, just got off oh. turnovers and they didn't oh, go I back forgot. to him. I forgot so the bad message turnovers. received in the second half. He was he was much better in the second half, but those back to back just just despicable turnovers and Mike Brown pulled him immediately. Good for him. We saw a lot of Delhi. Holy hell, there was a lot of Delhi. That was those a spin sprints are paying off, man. And by the way, <laughs> are they though? Are they are they Brendan? <laughs> I've been I've been very tough on Delhi, just wondering if he can still play. My God, that guy can foul the best of them. Like, no, I'm not you had a joking, moment. Man. You had a moment where you were reading lips. You're like, tell oh tell God, the people, great. the good people. You had your camera focused <laughs> on a situation on the court. Uh, go ahead and, and walk us through that. I forgot who the guard was, and I'm sure someone will be able to. It was it in CJ. The eventually, was it CJ McCollum? So so Delhi fouls the shit out of somebody, and, and I'll just say somebody of the Pelicans because I'm not even convinced it was CJ. But no, I'm not either. It might have been Brandon Ingram. He bounces like off of Delhi, like it was like a collision. Um, he took exception to it. The, the the player took exception to it and is kind of staring at Delhi. And Malik Monk's like, "Don't do that. That's a flop." Like basically saying, "Don't look at my guy. You just flopped." And then Delhi goes over and says, "No, no, I hit him." <laughs> and Delhi, and so Monk is like, "Oh, okay, my bad." <laughs> so <laughs> basically insinuating like Malik is like, "Stay off my guy. Uh, you you totally flopped. There is no way Delhi could have done that." And Delhi's like, "No, I leveled the hammer. I leveled the boom to him." So yeah, he used his that, fouls nice. They felt it, him. It was good stuff. Like, but he was also wasn't he zero for four from the field? He was terrible. <laughs> he's gonna hurt himself taking a jump shot man like it, it hurts me it hurts, to watch sometimes it, yeah i was gonna say it hurts me like my elbow hurts my shoulder hurts my low back hurts i'm like yeah that's that that's not good that's not how good. many minutes did he have like 18 almost 19 i think 15 and 48 oh. seconds oh my bad i thought it was a little bit more than that uh i also Who's thought the player it was that got in for 0.5 seconds oh kessler yeah that's right uh, <laughs> that's what, I, sh- I was sitting next to Sean. I'm like, oh man, Kessler Edwards is gonna get 0. 0.5 of a second played in this game, and got you're like, a minute. well, he got a minute, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah, pretty <laughs> brutal. Uh, he his um, he played less than one second in the game uh, to end the half. Um, and again, that came on the Trey Lyles crazy and one to finish the half, right? So they put him in for I guess so no one else picked up fouls. Um, just like the game before wasn't, we, we saw everyone. We saw, uh, we saw PJ Dozier. We saw Alex, Alex Len, Len made an appearance. Um, Rashawn Holmes tweeted out today, uh, that he thinks it's time for his locks to go. Are you guys ready to see, uh, like Rashawn Holmes Don't without hair? Don't do it. I think he, I think he did it. I'm not sure, but I'm, I'm pretty sure. Like he's been active on social media today. I don't know. It's interesting. <laughs> yeah, I I, uh, I don't really have much of a thought on that. I just I I, I like the 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 I, I like I like him looking that way. He looks menacing. He, he looks the like look. a tough guy. Yeah, um, but if he cuts it off, I mean that's I don't care. It's that's his call. Hopefully his wife likes it, or hopefully his people like it. I don't know. His family. <laughs> his people. <laughs> his family. Yeah. Um, let's see. Uh, Kevin Herter over his last 
four games, uh, he's averaging 23 points, 4.8 4. assists, 2.3 rebounds, 63% from the field and 58.6% from three. It feels like he's back to that dude he was in the first, like, 10 games of the season, doesn't it? He's been so good. And specifically last game, you know, in the game prior against Minnesota, Coach Brown came out post game and specifically called him and Malik Monk out for getting one rebound. And I thought that those guys specifically had a lot to do with some of their defensive issues in that game against Minnesota. But Herter was so active on that end of the floor. Um, he's not phenomenal. Like there's a reason that New Orleans is still saying, I want that guy switched on to me, but they're showing and he's recovering okay. Um, and, and the effort is always there with Herter. And I thought he did a great job making sure to help the helper there and get those rebounds. And those eight assists are huge, man. In a game where there's no De'Aaron Fox, I thought that he did a great job doing everything. It's not just the three-point shot going down, which is obviously a huge factor when it comes to the sort of production that you're getting from Kevin Herter. But I thought that yesterday was maybe the best game we've seen from him. There's there's probably one or two others this year that he had that well-rounded of a game, but it wasn't just the shot. It's the finishing. It's using the threat of shooting to cut back door and finish around the rim, the playmaking that he was setting up other players. Coach Brown even mentioned post game, like the pace in the half court is so important. There's plays where Herter is cutting so hard without the ball that it sets up somebody else. And that doesn't show in the stat sheet at all for Herter. I thought he had a great game all around. I think he's probably more accurate from like, I, I even asked him after the game, like from 26, 27, even 30 feet, so far back behind the arc, uh, the, the three-point line, it seems like he's almost more automatic from there than he is just taking a you know, toe beyond the three-point line kind of shot. So, uh, yeah, he was draining some from deep. It's good to see him. He was doing that in the previous game too. Uh, I feel like he's he's got kind of that, that, that swagger back again. Um, he answered the key, like you mentioned, Brennan. He answered the call from coach, kind of getting on him a bit, especially without Deer and Fox in that game. And I feel like there's a level he can sustain. And and for me, it's I just you know I I don't worry about his shot too much. I know that it, it's there's been some hiccups along the way, but um, defensively, yeah, I just remember him being much more of a of a pain in the ass than he's been in in this season for the Kings on the, on that end. And uh, I don't like to see them think that he's the guy you can single out because he's had you know when he was in Atlanta and maybe it was just the pieces around him he had to me a more tenacious kind of approach to to guarding that position so um I'm curious to see how that will happen what that looks like in a in a big seven game series where he might be asked to do a little bit more yeah I mean it's a lot different when you have Clint Capella at your back playing defense like who's a shot blocker and a rim protector and all that stuff like uh, i just think you know sabonis uh, to me really hasn't been the problem defensively i think he's actually been really solid as far as like a defensive leader on the backside he's just not a shot blocker and right. be different that's... if they had nerlens noel i'll oh, stop it <laughs> yeah. yeah he'd Clearly. be sitting there getting splinters in his ass that's what we... <laughs> <laughs> he wouldn't even get off the bench <laughs> oh that's funny sean uh, yeah, I know someone in the comment section, they did not like that I said the Kings still need a big man. I'm like, uh, uh, whatever. Like, uh, it is. I mean, they do. They just need one that can play. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, I, I totally I totally agree. And then, and yeah. I have no problems with Kessler. And that was the other comment. Someone was upset that we disrespected Kessler Edwards. I'm did like, we? look, I, what I don't think. Say? No, we said nothing negative about Kessler. Oh, okay. We're just like, like whether he's going to play or not. And, I, you know, again, he played 0.5 of a second the next game. That's kind of Mike Brown. Like, if there's going to be a moment for Kessler Edwards, it's going to have to come in, like, weird situations where nobody's able to stop somebody, and you're going to go to him. If not, Mike is going to do what every coach does in this situation and rely on the eight guys that got him there, and eight and a half, and, you know, if Terrence Davis isn't doing things properly, uh, it, it'll drop back down to eight, and we'll see less of, less of him and more of others. You know, people... <laughs> Just because you see Kessler Edwards play well in one game doesn't mean you're going to see him again. And and to that point, like people, all Kings fans love Keegan Murray. Well, who did Ke who did Kessler Edwards minutes come from? They came from Keegan Murray because he was yep. garbage in that game. 
Um, and look, I'm not saying they couldn't go back to him, but they didn't be bun just by virtue of how well Kessler Edwards played. So if you try to map out your minutes and you spread them all around, um, if you want guys to reach the, the averages that they have, and, and, and unless you're, you know, mixing up the, uh, the rotations and, and cutting minutes for certain guys, who do you take the minutes from? Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. There's, there's, it's really difficult to get a guy on the court. It's the same reason why Casey Akpala hasn't played like hardly at all this season. So, um, uh, yeah, we had, we had a funny moment, uh, again, big shout out to prize picks who is, uh, who is helping us out with sponsorship here on the King's Beat <laughs> podcast. Um, it's on the audio file. So if you're not listening to the audio file, you're watching on YouTube, you don't get the ads and all that stuff that we have for, uh, for prize picks. But, um, Keegan, of course, scored zero. So, uh, his projected number was 11 and a half points for, uh, for the game on, what was that? Is it today, Tuesday on oh, Monday night? So, uh, I had, I had taken three, uh, like I had chosen three players. I went, uh, I predicted that, uh, Donovan Mitchell would score more than 26.5 points, which he did. Uh, I think I had Bogdan Bogdanovich was projected at like, oof, I want to say 10 and a half points and he scored 12 and I, and I predicted he would score more. And then Keegan was, uh, predicted to score like 11 and a half points. And I'm like, eh, I think he'll have a bounce back game. So it added an element to the game while we were watching, uh, where everyone for you, <laughs> well, for me, but everyone was kind of laughing because, Keegan kept missing shots and, and things kept going wrong. He had some open looks from three and then finally he got it. Brennan, you have something to say there. He was sitting at 10 for a little while. For and that was, while. <laughs> that was, that was the last one in your little parlay. So I thought it was pretty funny. He, he was sitting there for a little while. There was this back cut he had where it was like, Oh, this is the moment. And then this he dropped the, the pass. And it <laughs> yeah. was, it was tough. A wide open three end. clank, a wide open three clank. You're just sitting there like, Oh, this is not good. Either way, like I found it fun. Like I, I don't really care. It's not like uh, I'm out there, you know, uh, placing the house on the line here. Uh, but it, it, it was it was fun. Yeah, there was no. There goes the college fund. Uh, there was no boat <laughs> money involved here. Uh, it was it was fun, and it was fun because uh, like everyone around us knew that, which was my fault, that Keegan needed uh, 12 points in order for me to take home. Uh, the I'm going to get in on it. I'm going to do it. It's a blast. I'm having a good time with it. Yeah. So um, let's uh, let's talk about the other thing that happened in the game. And that was that uh, Harrison Barnes barked at an official in an egregious way. Seven minutes in, almost 48 minutes into this podcast. I was wondering when it was going to happen. We are, we pushed this off for too long. I loved it. Go ahead, James. Like he Shame just he, like, rah, 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 rah. like, oh, look at that. And he didn't even... You know, he didn't say profanity, not that I could tell, uh, watching even the replay back a couple of times. I don't think he dropped an F-bomb or anything. Um, that's something that Draymond Green does, like, like at least 25 times per game and never gets called. But Harrison Barnes, they're like, oh, well, that wasn't appropriate from you. <laughs> like, you get a technical. That's the first yeah. time since his rookie season he had gone 11 seasons without a technical. You ever see Semi-Pro? Yes. yes oh my yes. god wait oh let's go god. brennan saw a movie not a very good movie i mean it's got some great moments but will ferrell starts arguing with the official and when he goes like full expletives on him that was harrison barnes version of that like that i mean certainly he's capable of more but draymond gets to do that because he keeps it 100 like he keeps it it's it's always that way yeah so you Boss have to it's find always it. running Right, so you've got to find something that is above the expectation that you've set. Harrison Barnes has only two technicals have come from his rookie season. If he does something like that, that's the equivalent of what Jackie Moon did in Semi Pro. Um, I'd like to know what his texts were his rookie season too. I kind of feel like they were like hanging on Grab the rim. Crotch. Yeah, no, like hanging on the rim too long. <laughs> No, he had to change his ways. <laughs> Called him a what did what did Crash Davis call him? 
Maybe maybe Harrison Barnes came out of Carolina with, and that's what changed. He got his two texts, and he completely changed his ways from his hair changed on out. his whole life. Yeah. Uh, he found he found Jeebus right then. Uh, <laughs> um, no, he does like he is a he goes to chapel every day. He is a God fearing man. He is a guy who like you you don't expect the explicits from. Um, unlike Fox, who like on occasion drops the f bomb in the middle of. Uh, post game and stuff like that but yeah I, I don't know brenda did you have any thoughts on harrison fox tweeting post game um adding harris barnes and saying you can have a few of my texts was pretty funny i think De'Aaron's up to 11 on the year which is uh, a season high for him but i loved mike brown's comments post game i think sean you asked him at the start of the presser and mike pretty much was like listen if if hb is getting a tech the ref probably missed something like that, that doesn't ever happen. And I totally agree. But to see HB sort of like have a little bit of a flex and then some sort of comment towards the ref was, that's a great moment. It's a great moment. It, it's it, You're never going to see that happen again. So I'm glad I got to witness it. We, I had wondered if, if, like sometimes you have a coach that goes out there and gets a tech. Like Mike Brown went out there and played the baseball manager and got tossed out of the game in Toronto and look what it did, you know? It, mm-hmm. <laughs> it's like sometimes you need one of those moments. And I was wondering if like, hey, Harrison go get one and uh, that clearly wasn't the case because um it happened on the offensive end uh it happened where foul probably should have happened it just seemed completely organic but it kind of had an effect man and even Kevin Herter after the game was talking about first he of all took he credit. wanted to take credit yeah he wanted yeah. to take credit for <laughs> saying hey Harrison get some uh get some text for us like that'd be great um man he ain't trying to lose his money it's funny uh someone's paying it someone's gonna pay it by the way you think so Oh yeah, come on. Well, Fox be, got, watch it be watch it be rescinded. Fox got that money. <laughs> uh it should be rescinded. It that, was that's an egregious no call. Yeah. Did you did you actually watch the the playback to see if he actually got fouled? He definitely got fouled. The guy yeah, yeah. The guy came over the top and totally hit his arms on the way down. Oh, gotcha. Huh. Yeah, I, that was uh Kevin's point too. He said that guy goes to the rim way too often with like power moves. And gets hit almost every single time. And we get all these touch fouls on Domas. And that guy's getting just buried. And they're not calling anything. Um, and then I think to myself, how many times do I remember Harrison Barnes at the free throw line lately? And it's a lot. Like it's a lot. 8 out of 10, 8 out of 8. Um, like he's been to the free throw line a lot lately. Uh, we also got into a discussion with, uh, with Red Velvet about uh, <laughs> dunks. Because he had that that funny dunk where he had the breakaway, and it almost looked like the guy thought he was gonna like hold up and like wait for his teammates, and then Kevin ran at the rim and dunked it really fast. Um, and I think we we looked right, Michael or somebody looked last night, or maybe it was Frankie looked, and uh, Herder's up to before those two dunks. I think he's up to thirteen on the season, and I think we started it with because Harrison had 38 dunks coming into the game which is way more than typical and Herder was laughing he's like yeah like he's like one of the last seasons I I only had like three dunks and we looked it up and I think it was like was it four or six dunks last season for Herder total and this year he's at like 15 it doesn't really matter but it's still it it was kind of a fun conversation with the guys behind the scenes have um, you seen the two the two fans um, in the lower bowl <laughs> yeah, wearing yes. the red velvet jackets and crush red velvet j- jackets? Yeah, I, I and I think one of them's got a red toupee or a wig. I don't know what the <laughs> hell that is. I hope that's not his real hair, but if it is, I'm sorry. Um, uh, but yeah, funny. they look like they they are the biggest Kevin Herter fans that I've seen in the building. They go nuts every time he he does anything. They do. <laughs> they they, do. they literally go wild, and it it almost looks like Santa suits from across the room. Right. Uh, but yeah, they when you get up a little bit closer, uh, like it, they're they're pretty crazy. I, I want to see Kevin see take a picture with them. Kevin has to take a picture with them. And I, I think he said it. I don't know if it was shoot around or practice that like you know maybe one day we can get the whole stadium to wear some wigs. And I think that's a solid idea. I huh. think he said it might be a little distracting, which I would agree. But did you I, notice he I think he looked at it. me? He looked at me when we <laughs> when he was telling this, and I'm I just wonder looking why he like, did that. Well, first of all, I'm not wearing a wig. Secondly, I don't have to. Uh, I, I got the red hair, so we're good. Yeah, yeah it was. Yeah, he's he's fun. I, I like uh, I like Kevin. 
Yeah, what I, what I asked him, team are. what I asked him about, uh, coach calling him out for a lack of rebounding in that game against Minnesota, what his reaction was to that. He said, Domas has got to quit stealing my rebounds. Yeah, he's, he's right. Kevin is pretty <laughs> funny. Which, by they the way, happen. this year, he's 12 of 13 on dunks. I don't remember a missed dunk. This is according to basketball reference. Um, but there was five dunks last year. He's 12 of 13 this year, though, on dunk attempts. Okay. He also, I'll, I'll tell people, there was a uh, jar uh, in uh, Keegan Murray's locker that was like uh, the uh, stealing Sabonis's rebound jar for when he got called out for not rebounding earlier in the season. So yeah, I, I think this team is funny. They, they have some moments. Uh, your, your guy, Chris Tavares, we'll call, we'll give Chris a shout out. He had an interesting, uh, like interview session the other day. And, uh, like what was, what was the first thing he said, Brennan? Um, did like you guys get your ass kicked or like, or like, like, what did she just say? <laughs> Like it was something about you got your ass kicked the other night. Like, how do you respond coming into tonight? And then the next question featured some big word that honestly I don't know the definition either, but I oh, could have picked it vitriolic. up. Vitriolic. Vitriolic. And, and uh Kevin Herter just looks at him like, that's kind of a big word. And he's like, I don't even know what I I don't even think I know what that means. Um uh, yeah, it it was fun. So Chris had a, a couple of moments there where um uh, he he was he was fun. So shout out to Chris if if you're listening, yeah. Chris. Shout out, uh, yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so let's get to uh, the last thing on the list, which is the business of basketball. Ooh, ooh. Um, I was sitting uh, courtside yesterday uh, before the games, talking uh, talking to our friend Gary Gerald, uh, Sacramento Kings legend Gary Gerald. Matter. And what was that? I said, you might have heard of him. Yeah, you may have heard of him. Uh, yeah, he, he's kind of a big deal. Um, and it was like, I'm like, what do you think is going to happen tonight? He's like, I don't know. I'm like, this is kind of a big one. He's like, it is kind of a big one. And I said, do you ever find yourself just completely not sure what's going to happen here with this team? And you know they're probably going to win, but because of what we've been through over the last, like, you know, 16 years – you really can't get fully comfortable. He's like, I do feel that way all the time. I never know, and I don't want to get my hopes up because of what's happened in the past. And I'm like, I think we have, we, we might need to seek counseling for this. And he's like, yeah, this is, he's like, you're probably right. We're just a little gun shot here. Do you guys feel that? Or are you guys all, like, you guys were way, hey, this is a good team, like way back when, like in December or early January, right? Uh, you well, guys did, both made when, that claim. Yeah, when did I say that? I mean, it, I, I I felt like this will be a team that will be a tough out in the playoffs, and I and I still feel that way. Like I, I mean, you don't get up to second or third and just playing a style of basketball that all of a sudden is going to change dramatically in the in the postseason. And I think that's a it, it can be a tough. It can be a tough way to play uh, for opposition. Now, you know, you're not getting teams on second nights of a back to back in the playoffs. You're not getting, you know, guys resting injuries in the playoffs. So, yeah, admittedly, it can look a little bit different in that regard. But I, I, this is a, I mean, dude, you're the best offense in the history of the NBA. And it seems weird to say that. Um, but no, it, because of that, this is a very, very good team. I, didn't think that they would be this high up in the standings. And I thought it was all about the playing tournament for them. I thought that's where they live. But after they held on to third for greater part of a month, you know, I didn't think that they were going to fall past six at that point. And I, I had said as much. So, um, no, this is a, this is a damn good team despite a lot of their flaws and, and things that they want to leave uh, up. <laughs> You'd rather see uh, improvements on the defensive end and some of those shortcomings that they have, but um, they, they, the chemistry is fantastic. They play with joy. They share the ball. It's an unselfish team. They want to see others do well. Uh, and, and because you see someone doing it every single night, that's a, that's a, you see someone else doing it every single night. That's a characteristic of a really, really good basketball team. So, um, yeah. And I, I even had someone, they, they someone on the Pelicans asked me last night where it's, it's, do you believe it yet? And I said, well, I believe it, but you know, 
again, everyone's got a, got a bullseye on Sacramento. They want to see this team in the playoffs. It's not just the Lakers. We talked about that in previous podcasts. Like, this team's going to make the postseason. There's, they're not falling out of it. It's, it would take a, you know, a turn of horrific events. And, and maybe there's people who've just experienced too many bad things. I'm confident in saying that that won't happen. And hopefully they can, you know, sustain it in the playoffs a little longer. And you heard Chemezi Metu on the postgame show last night. Mike Brown's got them believing in, you know, watch your ears, but NBA finals, you know, and, and that's honestly the way they should be feeling. Brandon. I don't, I don't know about that when you're the 25th <laughs> well, ranked defense, but all right. <laughs> I, I, you you want, should I, believe. You should believe, but I don't yeah. believe. No, you should. Your players should believe. Your players right. should absolutely be believing that you are um, the upper echelon of, of the league and, and that you're capable of pulling off such a feat, especially in a year like this, you know, because, look, you don't go through an entire season of, of being in that conversation you know, and then not look. Media may not put you in there, but you, you as players, can't go in there and say, "Ah, but we're not this, we're not that." No, you've shown to be an upper tier team in this league. Go do it. Yeah, 18. I mean, I think that the players absolutely should believe, and I think what I've been saying all year, and it hasn't changed, is that they're good enough offensively to win any game, and they're bad enough defensively to lose any game. And I don't think my feeling has changed on that at all. And no. You know, if you could take Sacramento's offense and Miami's defense and combine them into a team, you'd have a phenomenal team. Like you'd First have the Boston all, Celtics, you know. If you if you did that, you wouldn't be the their their commitment to defense would not allow them to be what they are offensively. Fair enough. Fair enough. You know, Dwayne <laughs> Dedman enough. can only play one side of the ball, I guess. Um, <laughs> uh, no, James but I, I mean I, I never know what to guess going into a game. If anybody tries to ask me, are they going to win tonight? I never have any clue because of what I just said. They could win any game. They could lose any game, I, which is basic and simple, I guess. But that's really how I feel going into every single night. So they've got to clean up the defense. I like that we have seen more zone recently just to switch it up sometimes because your man sometimes isn't getting it done. Like, just just switch it up every once in a while. I like that we've seen that more. I'm honestly surprised we didn't see it a little bit more earlier in the year. Um, and it's not something you can consistently do in the postseason or anything like that. But I think like on out of timeout plays and things like that, a, a lot of what you hear when when teams get thrown off by zones is like, well, we just still need to keep running our plays. And to me, what that means is that it just gets in people's heads. You know, it, it throws them off. You're, you're showing them a different look. So they need to clean up their defense a little bit. But if they're able to play defense for 20 minutes, I think that they're in most games late in it and you have maybe the best clutch score in the league. So it's a decent formula. Okay. Um, 18 games remaining. Just real quick. Uh, what are we doing? We're not picking a record here, are we? Can they Can they get to 50? Sure. That's 12 and 6? No. I don't I don't think they're going to do it, though. Okay. Okay. <laughs> they're pacing for do you? 48, 40, 48.5, 49 right there. Just get it's, 45. The, the schedule's tough. 45, you think they're they're going to go... That that would mean they finish the season 7 and 11? Well, I'm saying that... Look, you want to have, like, have visions of success, but that's an attainable goal to me. And even if you have a losing record the rest of the way, 45 could be something that's just circled. Like, get to 45, figure it out from there. Get your 45th win, and then, then let the chips fall where they may. Brennan? I think get your 39th win and then just figure it out from there, you know? <laughs> rest, your, rest your guys the rest of the way. Uh, no, I, I think like a 47-ish is kind of what we're talking about. You know, they, they have been playing well. Like there are the same concerns that we've seen on the defensive end, but it's nothing new. They're still phenomenal on offense, but 7-3 and three in their last 10. And, and post-All-Star break, they've been playing pretty well. So I'll say about 47. They're They're – they're so competitive. They're in every game, despite what you see defensively. And their competitive nature is, to me, something that doesn't get talked about nearly enough. You know, I, I know people talk all about the scoring, and, and rightfully so. But the way this team competes is ironic because they don't show it on the defensive end uh, through the majority of the game. So uh, it, it's it's really a staple of this team. They really have a. a 
I wouldn't call it a toughness, but it is a fortitude. It is some sort of grittiness. Uh, I guess you can just choose whatever word you want to use, but um, that that really, you know, becomes a hallmark of this team in any game they are because they'll go up against different styles of, you know, defenses and offenses and teams that are upper echelon teams and whether or not they have everyone or not. Sometimes it's even better to go up against teams when they have everyone as opposed to have a you know going up against somebody you haven't scouted for uh and it it that can be sometimes difficult so and we've seen that in recent years but they do they have like a fortitude about them that uh keeps them i i don't know if it's an identity but it's definitely a calling card for this team okay so here's what i'll say they the kings play the knicks who should be on a 10 game winning streak when they play on on thursday night it's a tnt game uh make sure everyone knows that it's not going to be on your regular station um, over on Terrence Davis. Uh, there you go. Uh, they face uh, the Phoenix Suns in Phoenix on Saturday. They face the Milwaukee Bucks at home on Monday. I think I'll say if they go one and one and two, and that they they got a shot at fifty. If they don't, if they lose all three, I'm going to put them forty seven forty eight. So that's where I would be. You win one of those games, and you come into the final. 15 games needing you know like I, I think you got a shot so and the way and what's happening in memphis i mean do you how how far do you feel that they like it's still a damn good team if john morant isn't even on that i i mean i don't want to take away from them they're, they're still a solid solid team but they're not the same so i don't think john morant plays the rest of the year that's mm-hmm. my that's my own that's my own take. They're a but. mess, man. They're a mess. Brandon Clark popping his, his Achilles. Uh, Steven Adams is still back. And did you hear that Steven Adams had just given a locker room speech about <laughs> not going out and partying all night after every single game? And that was before the situation happened. Um, yeah. I mean, they got Desmond Bain. He's still good. They, you know, they'll get... Uh, Dylan well, Brooks is back. Until Tyus Dylan Brooks Jones gets really good. Found. Tyus Jones is fantastic. Go dude. He does and, not make uh, mistakes. No, he's and got. got he's and, one of the and, greatest assist to turnover ratio guys in the history of the game. It's it's. And by the way, he does. Luke Kennard's a really good pickup for them. I think so too. I think he's. Yeah. They got That's a lot of shooters. I'm gonna go out on a limb here and say. <laughs> I see I, what you did, Brendan. I yeah. There we go. You funny guy. Uh, uh, I'm gonna go on a limb and say that the Clippers probably made a mistake <laughs> swapping out Eric Gordon for Luke Kennard. So, so. Do, do, so, but you think the Kings will get second, right? You think they're gonna they're half game behind tonight. If Memphis loses tonight, they're tied for second. Do you think they can get sole possession a second? I think they can get sole possession a second, but I don't know if they can hold on to second with Phoenix sitting there. Phoenix I, looming. I, I think that they'll finish either second or third. That's just my opinion, uh, that they'll finish either second or third. I don't know. You're saying Sacramento. Sacramento. But I think that it will be either Phoenix or them in number two or number three. And then how? if that happens, how far does Memphis fall? Four. I don't think they, they – just yeah, by the loss column, yeah. they can't fall that much further. I mean, they could fully hit the skids here like they have of late and really struggle, but I don't know. Okay, guys, we got to wrap this thing up. Um, I got a volleyball game to get to. Uh, do you guys have any final thoughts? I Is know Sean's got some. Yeah, my son has indoor volleyball. Yeah, playing on the volleyball team. Um, Sean, I'm sure you've got something with uh, Hassan Minhaj at the game last Hassan night. Hassan Minhaj? No, it was cool to see him, man. I saw him before the game, and he joked that uh, he scored just as many points as myself and De'Aaron Fox and in the Celebrity All-Star game. So, oh, um, sweet. No. No, hopefully, yeah, too, uh, hopefully we see him take over the Daily Show, right? That'd be that'd that be, cool. be amazing. Uh, if, you yeah, seen, also... if you haven't seen, watch the King's Jester on Netflix. His stand-up okay. special. It's one of the best produced stand-up specials you could probably see. It's really good. Okay, uh, Brandon, do you have any final thoughts? I don't. I have strength of schedule up right here. The Kings have the sixth hardest remaining strength of schedule, and it's worth noting Phoenix is third actually. So Mm. I I think that Mm. Phoenix is pretty good as well, but I think this top four will stay the same. Two, three, four might swap orders a little bit, but I think we're sticking with this sort of top four 
which would mean home court advantage in the playoffs. Like I said, what a time to be alive. What a time to be alive. Um, okay, my uh, my final thoughts. Uh, Don't be sad. On one side was uh, Hassan Minhaj. On the other side was John Fisher, uh, the owner of the Oakland A's. I don't know why in God's name Vivek wants to bring that nasty bad luck anywhere near his building. How dare you talk about Hassan Minhaj that way? No, I'm talking about John Fisher. I'm talking about John Fisher, the the god awful, horrible shit baggery of an owner of the Oakland A's. Uh, that guy needs to be launched into space in, in a capsule. Uh, <laughs> what he's done to the Oakland A's fan base is one of the most disgusting things that have ever happened in pro sports. And I, I don't know why you let him in the building. Uh, he was in Sacramento. He did a walkthrough. Uh, the only uh, like little glimmer of hope that I think anyone should have, uh, if you're an A's fan, is it somehow... Vivek had some grand plan to buy the River Cats and then convert the stadium into the A's stadium and move the Oakland A's to Sacramento. And that would be a coup and spectacular. And I would be very happy. Uh, but I then think you'd I, really like John Fisher, right? John Fisher would be welcome at the Ham household. He would be welcome. Happen. He would be welcome allowed at to the stay Ham on Earth. household. Uh, I would even <laughs> wear some like Gap Dockers, you know, like because he's the Gap guy, right? He'd go from being launched into space to being launched into space, launched into space. Like, the, wow. yeah, that's just horrible what he's done. And there's no reason like buying a professional sports team is supposed to be for the, the extremely rich. And like, he's, I think the third richest major league baseball owner. And he's just dumped on that, fr- that franchise and that it, it, the fan base. I mean, like he doesn't deserve fans. And that's that's horrible. So, uh, so don't bring that mess anywhere near Sacramento again. Like, I like that's some bad juju happening right there. Like, you don't need that guy anywhere near your team. That's that's just like. I think yeah. there's a positive there. Like, you know, look, rich people are always going to associate with rich, super rich people. That's that's at least things I've learned in my years on this planet is that yeah. the rich love to hang out with the rich. So, uh, you know, as if Vivek embarks on new ownership of a baseball team, maybe you just want to you know, get the full broad scope of the good and the bad, you know, he's known him for well, you got the bad, evidently that's for sure. a long time. So, you know. yeah, you, you had the, you, you bought the giants triple a affiliate. So you got right. some of the good, uh, and then you, you got, maybe that's it. Maybe you needed the two extremes, the like good ownership and the worst ownership in the history of ownership. And maybe so. you're getting like a, a power, ownership group with Vivek Ranadive and Hassan Minaj because Hassan Minaj had a jacket. Buying the A's? Well, I'm not going to say it. Moving him to Sacramento, Sean? The, the, biggest, the, the biggest celebrity Kings fan wearing a jacket courtside in nothing but pennants of baseball teams. And I don't know Hassan Minaj to be a baseball fan, but all of the pennants on his green jacket, green jacket too, by the way, were this all some tinfoil hat stuff going on right here. Baseball teams. So, tinfoil yeah, hat. Just, just saying. <laughs> all right uh that's gonna do it for this edition of the king's beat podcast again if you're watching on youtube uh please give us a thumbs up if you're new to the show subscribe all of those things help us uh join us at the kingsbeat.com we're growing like crazy like what's happened in the last couple of weeks has been absolutely spectacular and super exciting to see on the king's beat uh i attribute the king's winning um to that and uh so thanks to everybody who's new uh, and, and just jumping on with the King's Beat. But uh, make sure to subscribe, become a premium subscriber. We'll have a happy hour coming up probably next week. I'll have a guest announcement and all that stuff in the coming days. We'll be back later this week with another podcast. We'll probably have to go on Friday because the Kings are playing on Thursday night, and we like to have fresh content uh, to speak on. But uh, thanks for joining us here on this adventure on the King's Beat podcast. So for... Fox 40, Sean Cunningham, and of course, Brenda Nunes from the King's Pulse podcast. I am James Hamm, King's Insider for ESPN 1320 and the King's Beat. See you later this week.